So far, we have covered the tragic boating accident in Beaufort, South Carolina, resulting in the death of Mallory Beach, the mysterious death of Stephen Smith in Hampton County, South Carolina, and the murders of Paul and Maggie at their hunting lodge called Moselle. There's a lot going on here, and if this was the whole story, it would be easy to speculate that the boating accident and or the death of Stephen somehow led to the murders of Paul and Maggie, and maybe one day we'll find out for sure if they did. But this story keeps getting more and more complex, and there's actually a chance that the murders of Paul and Maggie had nothing to do with the events that we have covered so far. This episode, we're going to cover the death of the Murdoch family's housekeeper and how that event ultimately led to the arrest of Alec Murdoch three years later. Gloria Satterfield was the Murdoch's housekeeper for more than 20 years. She helped raise Buster and Paul and, according to the Murdochs, was considered to be part of the family. In February of 2018, Gloria suffered injuries at the Murdoch home at Moselle when she tripped over the dogs and fell down the front stairs. This event ultimately led to her death three weeks later. The 911 call was made by Maggie Murdoch, who passes the phone to Paul halfway through the call. I edited this call down some, but left most of it in, as this call not only gives us info on the situation surrounding Gloria's death, but is some of the only audio available of Paul and Maggie Murdoch, who were murdered three years later, just a few hundred feet from where this call took place. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Is she awake at all? Yes. Okay. Is she just not like responding appropriately, but she is awake? <laughs> Man, she's not. No, she's not responding. Okay, I just I'm, I've already got them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Knowing if she's conscious is one of the things that the medic needs to know. If she's responding not at really. all to you. No. Okay, so she's not responsive at all? Well, I mean, she's mumbling. Okay, so she is somewhat conscious. Um, is she breathing okay? Yes. Is she bleeding from anywhere? Yes, her head. Hey, are you guys able to control the bleeding? No. Can you put I a clean cry. rag or anything on it? I, yeah, I got it. Okay, okay, is she bleeding from, like, her face, the back of the head? I've got an neck. ambulance coming. Sir, my name m- what? Where exactly is she bleeding from on her head? I'm not sure. At the top of her head. Okay. What's okay. okay? Oh, can you, What happened? She just, she just fell back down. Can I get off this phone so I can go down there? Are, are you on a cell phone where you can walk down there I'm and on talk? A cell phone. No. Okay. Can you bring it with you so we can ask her some questions about what kind of pain she's having? Hello. Yeah. Can Can you ask the patient what kind of pain she's having? Ma'am, she can't talk. Okay, do you know... She's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete and she bleeds out of her left ear. Okay, she's bleeding out of her ear? And out of her head. She's cracked her skull. Okay. All right, the other lady said that she had tried to stand up and fell down again? No, she. I was holding her up. And okay. She told me to turn her loose and she was trying to use her arm, but then she fell back over. Okay, do you guys know who she is? Yes, yeah, she works for us. Okay, do you know if she's ever had a stroke or anything before? Ma'am, can you stop asking her to stroke? I already have them on the way. I already have them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down in any way. These are relevant questions that I have to ask for the ambulance. One of my questions is, has she ever had a stroke? I don't believe she's ever had a stroke, not that I know that. Okay. Okay, is she able to talk to you guys at all, or is she unconscious now? She's not unconscious. She's just mumbling. Okay. I believe she's maybe hit her head and had, maybe has a concussion or something. Okay. Maybe. Do you know what her name is? Gloria Satterfield. Okay. What's the house look like out there? It's a um. It's offset off the road. Okay. It's a big house, got a long driveway. With a long um, driveway. 
Yeah, um... Is there a date or anything down there that they're going to need to come is, through? There's two big, big brick columns that have to come through. Okay, but there's no, like, date code or anything that they need? No, ma'am. And tell okay. them that they can look for a fellow on a 6x6 six six Ranger. Okay. Waiting on them in the road is green. You know what the... They probably know what the Ranger looks like. Yeah. You said, like, Fellas green... Got on a black... Got on a black sweater. Okay. A hat. And pants. Okay. All right. All right. Um, if, if something changes with her, if she loses consciousness or anything like that, I need one of you guys to call me back right away, okay? Okay, well, how about, how long is it going to take? Cause this take us that I don't know. I, I've had them on the way since, since Maggie first called me. They were toned right away. Okay. Thank you. All right, but like I said, if something changes, call me back. Yes, sir. This is kind of a side note, but some people listen to this call and hear an inconvenienced Paul and Maggie frustrated that they have to deal with this situation in the first place. I hear two people who just want EMS to get there as quick as possible and are frustrated with the amount of questions being asked. One of my best friends is an emergency dispatcher and he told me that this is a common occurrence. When you call 911, the dispatcher gets the location and immediately emergency services are dispatched. At this point, the more information they have, the better. From a dispatcher's perspective, once all seemingly relevant questions are asked, you have to think up more questions on the spot. Oftentimes, these can seem irrelevant, but they're worth asking even if there's only a small chance the answer has some relevance to the situation. Asking more questions will not slow EMS down, so they might as well make the most of the time they have until EMS arrives. It seems to me if Maggie and Paul, like most people, just didn't quite understand this concept and felt the dispatcher was wasting precious time by asking so many questions. There was a settlement to be paid out from the Murdoch's insurance for Gloria's family because of her death. For a while, this was more of a footnote when it came to the Murdoch story. Obviously, it's very sad that someone lost their life, but there was no evidence of any wrongdoing or anything nefarious going on. But all of that changed when on September 14th, 2021, the Satterfield family came forward and said they hadn't received a dime from the settlement. Since then, we've discovered a lot about what really happened, and the full story is wild. Here's what really happened following the death of Gloria Satterfield. It's February 28th of 2018, and Alec Murdoch is at the funeral for Gloria. Alec approaches the family and tells them that he's going to take full responsibility for her death, and that he's going to set up the family with an attorney so they can file a wrongful death claim against Alec. It was his dogs that tripped her, and Alec has insurance for this type of thing, so it's only going to help the Satterfield family and won't really hurt Alec in any way. On the surface, this seems like a pretty kind thing to do. Alec didn't have to bring this up and has nothing to gain from doing so but did it anyway to help Gloria Satterfield's family. But as the story unfolds, it becomes pretty clear what Alec's intentions really were. I want to pause here and explain how this type of claim would typically unfold. These are the parties involved. First, you have a personal representative or PR of the estate. This person is a representative of the deceased person's family and is the only person the attorney can legally communicate with. In this case, the family member's name was Tony Satterfield, and the attorney's name was Corey Fleming, who was a good friend of Ellick's. The attorney files a claim for the PR against the insurance company. At this point, it's not a lawsuit. If the insurance company denies the claim, then the attorney and the PR can decide to file a lawsuit if they want to. If the insurance company accepts the claim, they write the check to the attorney, who instead of giving one lump sum to the PR, sends the money to a third-party company who sets up an annuity, which allows the money to be paid out over time and results in the family receiving significantly more than the original amount, while also avoiding larger tax implications. You can almost think of it as investing the money. The company often used in this area is a company called Forge Consulting. Now, the insurance company is in an interesting place in this particular scenario. They could deny the claim, but their client, Alec, is 100% admitting fault. So if the claim is denied and a lawsuit is filed, the amount the judge grants could be even higher, especially in the judicial hellhole of Hampton County, where Alec Murdoch has strong roots. So what happened? Corey Fleming convinces the family that the best way to move forward is to make someone else the PR. 
there's going to be a lot of complicated financial decisions to make and it's better to leave those in the hands of an experienced professional. The family agrees and Chad Westendorf, the president of Palmetto State Bank, becomes the new PR. At this point, Corey Fleming not only has zero obligation to communicate with the family, but legally isn't even allowed to. The insurance company agrees to the claim and ends up paying out a total of $4.305 million for the death of Gloria Satterfield. Here's the disbursement sheet which lists where the money is supposed to go. A total of $1.43 million goes to Corey Fleming for attorney fees, $105,000 goes towards prosecution fees, and the rest, a total of $2,765,000 is to go to the family of Gloria Satterfield. So where did it actually go? Corey writes out a check to Forge, not Forge Consultants, just Forge, and mails the check to a P.O. box in Hampton, not the Forge Consulting offices in Atlanta. Alec takes the check and deposits it in a bank account that he opened under the name Forge, and the family never sees a dime. So how did all of this come to light? On June 7th, 2021, Paul and Maggie are murdered at Moselle. Three days later, on June 10th, 2021, Mandy Matney with Fitz News published an article that detailed a settlement that was approved for the Satterfield family. This info is public and Mandy thought she was just bringing this info to her audience as it was a part of the wider Murdoch story. The Satterfields, however, were completely caught off guard when they saw the article, as they not only hadn't received a dime from that settlement, they weren't even aware that the settlement existed in the first place. They attempted to reach out to Corey Fleming for answers, but according to their current attorney, Eric Bland, they were never able to reach him. It's Friday, September 3rd, 2021, and according to the Murdoch law firm, PNPED, a check is found on Ellick's desk that doesn't look right. It's made out to Ellick. All checks are to be made out to the law firm, not specific attorneys, and Ellick is confronted about the check. After finding out that millions of dollars in checks had been written out to Ellick, not the law firm, they privately force Ellick to resign. Here's a statement that they later put out. On Friday, September 3rd of 2021, Alec Murdoch resigned from the law firm. He is no longer associated with PNPED in any manner. His resignation came after the discovery by PNPED that Alec misappropriated funds in violation of PNPED standards and policies. A forensic accounting firm will be retained to conduct a thorough investigation. Law enforcement and the South Carolina Bar have been notified by PMPED. Hampton County 911, what is your emergency? On um, Salkahatchee Road. Okay, what's the address on Salkahatchee Road? I'm by the church. Uh, what church are you talking about? Uh, I don't know the name of it with the red roof. Okay, what end of Sarcastic Road? Because I don't know what you're talking about. Um, at the Hampton County side. Okay, what's going on? I stopped, I got a flat tire. Mm-hmm. And I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay, were you shot? Yes, but okay. I mean, I'm okay. You shot where? Where were you shot at? Huh? Did they actually shoot you or they tried to shoot you? They shot me, but... Uh, okay, wait, you need EMS? Uh, well, I mean, yes, I, I can't drive. Okay. I'm and I'm bleeding a lot. Where, where part of your body? Uh, I'm not sure, somewhere on my head. Your head? Somewhere on my head. Somebody just stopped for me, ma'am. Um, for 911. Okay. Okay, and what's your name? I'm still here. I'm going to stay on the line with you. What's your name? Alex Murdoch. And you see you were driving, you got a flat tire, and somebody stopped to help you, and they shot you? Well, they pulled over, yes, ma'am, like they were going to help me. And can you give me a description of the person that shot you or shot at you? Yes, ma'am. I mean, it was a, a, a white fella. Uh... 
I'd say a white me. male, a fair amount younger than me, uh, really, really short hair. Um, you have an ambulance coming in? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I woke up the morning of September 4th, 2021 and put together a 60 second trailer for the first episode of this series. I posted it around 11 a.m. and was excited to see it getting a few hundred views. Just a few hours later, news broke that Alec Murdoch had been shot in Hampton. I grabbed my drone and drove over immediately. Alec's initial story is that he was tending to a flat tire when two men in a truck passed him, turned around to come back and shot him. But two days later, he put out this statement. The murders of my wife and son have caused an incredibly difficult time in my life. I have made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. I'm resigning from my law firm and entering rehab after a long battle that has been exacerbated by these murders. I am immensely sorry to everyone I've hurt, including my family, friends, and colleagues. I ask for prayers as I rehabilitate myself and my relationships. If Ellick's story is true, this is an extremely odd statement to put out. Eight days later, a man named Curtis Eddie Smith is arrested for an assisted suicide attempt on Alec Murdoch. Curtis Eddie Smith, who goes by Eddie, is a distant cousin of Alec's and had been hired by Alec to do odd jobs over the years. After Eddie's arrest, Alec's story changes. He now claims that he hired Eddie to kill him so that his son Buster would get his $10 million insurance payout. Here's what Alec's attorney said. On that Saturday morning, he was trying to get off the opioids, was in a massive depression, realized that things were going to get very, very, very bad, and he decided to take his life. He believed his $10 million life insurance policy had a suicide exclusion, so he arranged to have this guy shoot him. But here's what Eddie says about what happened that day. It was the craziest situation I ever been involved with. I was set up to be the fall guy. I got a call from Alec that Saturday afternoon to come to where he was and I thought it was maybe to fix something. I had no idea what he wanted. I just went over there. Eddie says that when he got there, Alec stepped out of his car waving around a gun like he was going to shoot himself. I run over and we wrestled a minute together, me trying to get the gun away from him. The gun kind of went off above his head and I got scared to death and I ran to my truck and took off. Eddie says he wound up with the gun and disposed of it down the road. We don't know the truth about what really happened that day, whether Alec is telling the truth, Eddie is telling the truth, or neither are, and the truth lies outside of both stories. Alec is currently in jail awaiting trial. One thing to note is that Alec's phony Forge bank account was opened three years before the death of Gloria Satterfield. This wasn't the first time he had done something like this, and many other instances have been uncovered. Alec Murdoch has been charged with multiple counts of breach of trust with fraudulent intent, obtaining signatures or property by false pretenses, money laundering, computer crimes, and forgery, totaling 48 charges, all of which are felonies. His bond was set at $7 million, and at the time of recording this, he has not posted bond and is currently in jail awaiting trial. Knowing what we know now, there are still many unanswered questions. Was the Murdoch law firm, PMPED, really unaware of what Ellick was doing? It's possible, but I find it odd that they just happened to find a check on Ellick's desk right around the time the Satterfields were asking where their money went. Could they have been trying to get ahead of the scandal by pushing Ellick out before the Satterfields came forward publicly? The next question to consider is what really happened to Gloria? Was her fall really an accident? The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, the same organization currently investigating the murders of Paul and Maggie Murdoch and Stephen Smith, opened an investigation into Gloria Satterfield's death, and hopefully we get some answers. I think Alec is a bad person, but I get the feeling that Gloria's death really was an accident and he saw an opportunity to capitalize on it. On that note though, looking back on the 911 call, there was zero mention of dogs. If the dogs didn't trip Gloria, would Ellick's insurance still be responsible for the payout? The last question I have is, where did all the money go? SLED has opened an investigation into Ellick's financial records, and we have some info on that, but as of now, SLED hasn't released much. So could the death of Gloria Satterfield, or everything that has been uncovered because of it, have led to the murder of Paul and Maggie. 
I absolutely think it could have, and we'll cover that in a later episode when we cover part two of the murders of Paul and Maggie. So far, over $6 million has been recovered by the Satterfield's current attorney, Eric Bland, for the Satterfield family. This money has come from Corey Fleming, Chad Westendorf, and others. But as of the time of recording this, not a dime has come from Alec Murdoch. It was said by Gloria's friends that she was an extremely hard worker. She was kind, she was genuine, and she was honest. She cared deeply for her family, who doesn't know her as the Murdoch's housekeeper, but as a loving mother, sister, and friend. In 1956, Randolph Murdoch Jr., Alex's grandfather, resigned from his position as solicitor when he was indicted by a federal grand jury for playing a part in illegal bootlegging in Hampton County. The charges were dropped and he was reinstated as solicitor. Today, Hampton County is riddled with illegal drugs. It's not hard to imagine an illegal bootlegging organization evolving into drugs over time, and from the beginning I've had a suspicion that drugs may have played a large part in the murders of Paul and Maggie. In the next episode, we'll dive into the Murdoch family and drugs. If you've enjoyed this video, I would be honored if you subscribed. To watch early releases of episodes, as well as additional content, head to patreon.com slash ericallen. Love you guys. See you in episode 7.